Hi there, you're listening to the LLB podcast, the podcast for law students and young lawyers. My name is Johnny Nguyen and I'll be your host today. Welcome to episode 14 of the podcast. This one is a must listen to if you're working in a government policy position currently or you want to get into one of those jobs. Today we're deep diving into what good government policy looks like. Our guest speaker is Jason Lange, and he works in a role where he and his team are responsible for the quality assurance of the Australian government's federal policies. And this gives him a really broad and deep experience to talk to us about in terms of what good policies need and look like. I hope you enjoy today's episode. I've got Jason Lange with uh, with me here today, and Jason is the Executive Director of the Office of Best Practice Regulation. Uh, this office sits within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in Australia. And today we're going to be discussing the work of the OBPR, the Office of Best Practice Regulation. To start us off here, can you tell us what your journey's been like getting to your position now? Uh, thanks, Johnny. Thanks for having me and thanks for the listeners for tuning in. Uh, so I've worked for about 17 years, uh, coming up to 18 years in the Australian Public Service and Victorian public service that find our states here. And uh, it was a bit of a surprise journey into the public service. I think um, there's several graduates, a fair chunk of graduates that want to dedicate their lives to the public service. Um, I'm not sure I was in that cohort um, (laughs) when I fell into into a role in 2004, but from day one, I was hooked in terms of the position of the public service being able to improve. The lives of Australians and contribute to some pretty interesting um, policies over time. So um, that journey took me from uh, from where I started um, through to where I am today, covering about six departments. Um, yeah, wow. Okay. Well, the question I always want to ask: since you've worked at both that national and state level, is there any interesting difference or similarity that should be noted in terms of working from different levels of government? Yeah, I think on, on paper, you think they're very similar. Um, one of the things that really stood out for me at the state level was um, the overwhelming desire to do it themselves, to do it with their budget, do it with their policies, not mm-hmm. to interact with the Commonwealth. Um, you know, very palpable from day one. And, you know, of course, the state budget is relatively finite. I mean, the Commonwealth budget's finite as well, but it's just dramatically bigger. Um, and you know, that was one of the, the big things I took out of the four years I spent there was this focus on really do it ourselves. And so what were, what were you doing at the state level exactly? Yeah, so part of the time there was that the Department of Planning and Cabinet and Industry Policy and a big chunk of time was in the Industry Department um, looking after uh, uh, one of the component parts was a review of economic development um, at, at the state level and another part was uh, an economic inclusion sort of like a labour market sort of um, social inclusion uh, policy role. So but all of it was in labour market or employment policy or industry policy in the state. Um, and you know, I'd say that the states are, are very good at, um, maybe because it might be a relative concept, but very good at you know, trains running on time, getting the police on the beat, um, you know, a lot of those operational things which I would not have a clue on how to do and would be terrible in those roles. Um, but I guess in the industry policy, it was um, very much a grants mentality. We run a grants round. We, we, we offer more grants. If something's going wrong, we just increase the size of the grants. Um, sure. And you know, a really big takeaway message for me was there's only so much a state government can do with a whole heap of policy levers that are within their control. And a lot of the issues that um, you know, I worked on or content I worked on was really not for the state to solve, right. uh, and you know that really that really was clear to me after the four years there was that it was really the Commonwealth that had a lot of those settings, which you know, needs to work in partnership with the states. Right. Uh, but if the state was not that keen on engaging with the Commonwealth, um, the other two were potentially at, at opposing ends of the spectrum, uh, and um, particularly with grants programs as well, they're just um, really designed for a particular purpose, but they don't solve the underlying problem. And so that was quite an interesting experience, thinking of grants as a mechanism 
mm. to connect with and give support to industry. But the clients and the contracts themselves, so they don't require much change. Yeah. You know, nothing really, you know, they get to the end of the grants process and that's with more grants, if you like. And, wow. So that was, uh, that was quite a, an insight. Uh, also at the state level, you're just so much more connected with the firms. Um, you know, this is the firm from John. They are in trouble. What can you do? Um, Premier, Premier's office. Um, it's just very, very, um, local and, um, you know, concepts, theoretical concepts of, you know, the firm should just change its, you know, focus or improve its factory or increase its R&D. You know, that's all well and good to have in your brain and in your mind, but sitting across the table from companies, um, you know, that's sort of the, the main topic of conversation you have with them, you know, because you're just right there next to them. And, you, know, you see the, the head of government or senior executives and when they're engaging with stakeholders, you know, they don't come at Come at it from a why don't you just increase your effectiveness? Um, whereas in Canberra, you know, that might be our first response, I guess. So sure. it's very applied policy yeah. at the local level, um, and there's a lot of pressure on what can we give them today, what can we do today for them, uh, sure. as opposed to looking at structural longer term changes. Yeah, so it sounds like your work at the state level will very much on the ground and applied. So Looking then at your experience uh, at the federal level, so, I mean, let's get to the bread and butter of the OBPR. What, what exactly does the OBPR do? Yeah, so sometimes I um, sometimes I describe the role as the homework police, um, <laughs> which um, may not be quite right, um, but in terms of those listening to this, perhaps maybe that's one way to describe it as non-public service. So, so any major decision of government that's coming forward, um, we look at it, and think, well, if this would have a major felt effect on business or individuals and how they change, go about their lives or if it changes their lives or how they operate their business, it's in our scope to determine if that triggers our involvement. So roughly, roughly about 70 to 80 times a year, um, we say this upcoming policy proposal is going to be so significant on business and individuals or community that it requires an additional level of analysis, an additional level of QA, um, by, by a neutral um, uh, third party other than the proposing ministry or department, uh, and our office gets involved. So we, um, first and foremost, are a coach with the agency to support them on building the evidence base and looking at the impact analysis, and I suspect we'll go through that in a minute, but also we're an assessor of their work. So ultimately, you know, we shift from being the coach to saying, is this work doing that? Does it meet the government's requirements for what the government expects to see? Analysis and advice from the bureaucracy to support some big major decisions they're about to take. Sure. So it sounds like it's not too different for university students listening to say they're tutored in their lecturers, or right? like they teach you the content, but they're also usually the ones that then mark your aircraft, your exams, etc. So yeah, that's right. Um, I guess people listening from the outside might think well, you're a bureaucrat, you know, working with other bureaucrats to look at the analysis, but uh, OBPR really takes its um, uh, its independence quite strongly from um, the rest of the bureaucracy. I mean, we are a branch and a function that sits within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, uh, but we really have quite a defined role, uh, a defined set of um, rules, if you like, frameworks or rules that we administer, which is um, you know, this lovely book here. Which I'm sure Johnny can have on the, on the link. But this is basically our requirements that when we work with another department, this is what they have to meet to get the new pass mark past us. Sure. So coming from the outside looking in here, how does OBPR potentially add value to a specialist agency when it itself might not be a specialist in that area? If a department of health has a health policy, how does the OBPR add value? Yeah, I think first and foremost, we freely um, acknowledge that we're not the content experts. If there's dramatic changes that are happening to um, making something a prescribed good, you know, perhaps um, the e, e, um, nicotine, nicotine containing e-cigarettes, for example, you know, the, the, the TGA, the health portfolio, are the professional experts. So I'm not quite sure you know, what goes in. But six months ago, I wasn't quite sure when, what went in an e-cigarette. Now I've got a lot more about it than perhaps I'd like. Um, but they are the content experts. What, think of it as this way. What we do is 
we work with that agency to say, well, what do you think are the effects on uh, any number of um, aspects of that? So what's the effect on competition if we were to ban you know, a certain product? What's the effect on uh, the price of goods or services or the entrance of new businesses or businesses exiting, um, potentially? Um, what are the distributional effects of play? Does it affect men and women the same? Does it affect regional and rural um, businesses? Well, can, can you explain what distributional effects are here? Yeah. So if as a direct result of that government decision, what are the effects on different cohorts? So mm -hmm. small and medium and large businesses, does it affect them in the same way? Um, does it affect men and women in the same way? Does it affect... Um, people located in regional or businesses located in regional settings as opposed to urban. So what's the distribution of that effect across the nation and by different cohort groups? Mm. You know, we might look at environmental effects, like what effect does this decision have on soil or air or water quality? Um, uh, there's two or three other types of effects as well. And so as a direct result of this decision about to be taken, how does it affect Australia? Mm. And not just in a fiscal sense, for that department, you know, they might need uh, ten millions of dollars to actually administer it. But what's the effect? Can we quantify it, or at least qualitatively and in great detail describe the effect on business and individuals? Second and third round effects as well, not just those immediately affected. And this is often where agencies will think of it as: if I ban this particular product or regulate this particular product, the firms that make it or buy it, this is how they're affected. But we come in and say, well, what are the second and third round effects? How does it then flow onto other people and other users beyond the immediately affected? That's an impact. That has an impact on people's lives. And often, in our experience, often a, a department will think about the impacts on their immediate stakeholders and their immediate um, first round effects, if you like. And what we do is we come in and do the evidence base to show whole of the economy and whole of government effects. Because, of course, if that department or that regulator wants to make that change, they think about what's in their act or who their stakeholders are to, as their lens of impact. But when that proposal comes to cabinet, when it comes to the PM for agreement, when it comes to um, budget for consideration, that we want, and government expects, that we think about the effect on the nation as a whole. Yeah. And so what are the other effects that that department or regulator doesn't necessarily see? They're probably quite well at spotting that they're around, but how do you put facts and figures or descriptions to it when they're impacting sectors or stakeholders outside of the direct vision? Yeah. Okay. And so we look at that whole of government picture. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a bit of scope for OBPR to give that higher level perspective that our specialist agencies might not get because they're very close to that industry. Do you have a, I guess, like a hypothetical practical example of I suppose the, the second round, third round impact, or the wider impact of a hypothetical proposal that might happen. Just because I'm aware, well, we, we can't talk about things that are on the wall. Yeah, so um, uh, say there's a particular financial product which the financial regulator thought might be causing harm to users. Um, so something that might be quasi-gambling in nature, for instance. And if that regulator was to say, right, we're just going to ban that product. You know, some of the first questions you'd ask is, well, how many people use it? You know, and um, you know, what utility do they get out of having the product? Maybe they know that there's a good chance they make a loss on it. Well, yes, but do they know there's a somewhat of a chance they make a, a win on it? Do they know that going in? Are they fully aware of those risks? Um, you know, or they were they given the the shiny iPad by a unscrupulous provider as a as a way to sign them into um, you know this particular financial incentive? Um, this particular financial product, you know, were they duped into it, in which case clearly, you know, that's a risk to the consumers, or were they fully aware of the risks and decided to do it anyway because they enjoyed the thrill of um, being on a, on a commodity? Um, so they're, they're things which we test, which is really understanding the evidence base. And regulators in Australia are very, very professional, very good at what they do, but by definition, a regulator sees a risk and it looks to minimise the risk. So the risk in that hypothetical example is potential consumer harm. Now, the purpose of regulation, the OBPR's role, is not to ensure that every risk is reduced to zero. 
but it's understanding, well, what is the presence of that risk or that hazard or that um, um, you know, issue in the community and where's the evidence base behind it to justify the imposition of regulation. Now, it may well be leading the obvious to everybody that that's something that we should shut down and ban. That's fine. But what we come in is we give a flat, neutral, independent assessment of if that risk, if there is a risk there, what's its prevalence? And what are the impacts of it? What's the status quo? If we did nothing, how is it hurting individuals or businesses or benefiting? And if we want to move away from the status quo, what's a range of valid and defensible options that should be considered? And what are the impacts of those? So that government is given you know, the best possible analysis of what the problem is and what the fix, what the solutions are. Sure, but it sounds like from far, a couple of things that you've mentioned that OBPR help agencies with are uh, identifying different options to solve potential problems and checking the underlying assumptions that lie behind their thinking. Can you run through, I guess, a high level overview of the framework that OBPR uses and, again, the areas where agencies get a lot of value from OBPR? Yeah, so, so there's many policy analysis frameworks out there in the world. Um, we have one that we like and, and think it's, it's pretty good, um, but there's many other competing frameworks out there. I guess the difference, of course, is that this is the one the Australian government has asked the Australian Public Service to look at and adhere to, so this is the one that we operate. But really, they're all, they're all pretty similar, in it, and it's a policy analysis framework. I mean, it's described as the regulatory impact analysis framework, but really it's policy one So, yeah, you know, you're starting with what's the problem? Now, that sounds very simple to many listeners, but you know, I challenge you to um, write in a sentence exactly what the problem is without pages and pages of context and background. So it's a really, really narrowing, precisely what is it that's the problem. And that's not the symptom. That's not the problem that the minister wants to create in order to act upon it. It's not the problem easiest for the agency to fix. It's not the part of the problem that's simplest for the agency to fix. It's what is the problem, the underlying cause of the issue you're trying to fix. And then the very next question is, well, why does government need to be involved? You would be amazed as to how many new policy proposals and work across the Commonwealth fall down at that step. Why is government needing to fix this? Why is it not a market or an individual's responsibility? Mm. Um, why does government, Commonwealth government need to fix this? And you go through the rest of the framework. So it's, well, what are the options that are available? Again, not just the options easiest for the regulator. What's the best whole of government options? Well, those options may sit in another department. You know, a department may be bringing forward a change, but the best option may be a revenue option for a taxation, or it might be banning something at the border, for instance, that completely falls outside that capacity of that department that rests with another department. So what's the best few options that could actually address it, not just their preferred favourite, but also... Um, several other options as well to show a full range has been considered. And then stepping through to which one has the highest net benefit. What are the pros and cons and the impacts of each analysis of each option and how do you get to a discussion around which one has the best benefit for the country? And critically, well, who have you spoken to and what have they said? Not just the stakeholders you've spoken to that like the idea, <laughs> all the stakeholders involved and if you haven't spoken to them, what would we expect them to say? So it's not plausible or feasible to consult every person in Australia on every major policy change. But what this framework does is it forces the department proposing the change to think through, well, here are what stakeholders are known to have said, or here's how they would likely react if they were presented with those options. So that decision makers see the full picture on what their views and reactions would be, not just, like I said, the, the, the group of stakeholders that are most um, best invested in the actual change. Yeah. Uh, and, and impact and evaluation is a really, really important aspect of this as well. So how will you actually um, um, deliver this um, particular change and how will you evaluate it? Um, but really the key the key question is which option do you recommend? Which option has the highest net benefit for Australia? Given all the above, given all the department's expert technical knowledge and the analysis that's been done and, and agreed with my office, how do you pick the option that's got the best, highest net benefit for Australia? 
So that's the framework we use. It's in that guide that um, I held up at the start. And that's really, a, it's a pretty sensible, in my view, of course I'd say this, but it's a pretty sensible. Uh, completely book. unbiased. Completely unbiased, but I think it's fantastic. Uh, it's a way to think about and, and frame really complex policy problems and step through, well, how am I actually going to fix it? Yeah. And putting it, and then the discipline of putting that on paper. Now, of course, um, some listeners may not know that every time this is done, where a government makes a decision, this document is released. It's publicly available on PMC's website. It's called a regulation impact statement. Then we renown the actual document, and that's released alongside um, OBPR's assessment of the quality of that work and the processes involved. So these things are freely available uh, on, on PMC's website. We can put that on top as well. Cool. And so, you know, I might ask you, when you see government announcing a major change to something, there's a very um, high likelihood that you'll be able to find a whiz on uh, PMC's website that steps through all of those things and shows citizens of Australia that the government and its departments have really thought through what the problem is and how to fix it and presented that advice to decision makers. I thought the OBPR and the team here have two really important functions on two dimensions here. So that, that last bit there, I know that it, it sounds like that's a really great vehicle for both the public generally to know about what government is doing. But in terms of the listeners here, if you're interested in any sort of government department that's doing anything major, you can probably increase your chances of applying their successful by just knowing how they go about their work. So looking at their risks, the things that they consider and how they analyze different stakeholders, different impacts, et cetera. But looking internally then, from what you've found, like from my experience being here in the team, it sounds like policy work is often just a minefield of potential blind spots. There's just things that are unintended that can happen and that it's a complex arena of, you know, it's an intertwining of all these different factors, different stakeholders, different potential consequences. And it sounds like the OBPR really has expertise in getting through this project in a really robust and comprehensive way, a systematic way of analyzing and making sure that you don't potentially forget to consult a certain stakeholder or, you know, consider a particular impact. With that in mind, I'm thinking it's probably a good thing for young APX officers, especially anyone aspiring to be a public servant, to engage with the OBPR when they do their work. So, at that point then, what's the best way? How should APX officers go about engaging with the OBPR to get the most value? Yeah, good question. So um, we have uh, dedicated personnel for allocated to and for each portfolio of Australian government. So the very first question would be call through on a, a general number or email address and find out you know, who looks after your portfolio. It might be Johnny looks after environment or Jane looks after home affairs, you know, whatnot, so we'll have a dedicated person. And, you know, really thinking about our role twofold. There's the, um, is a RIS needed? Is this impact analysis required for my decision? And you want to know that sooner rather than later so that you don't delay your processes of government through decision making and have over to our critique through government. Um, the quality of that work with the hosing, we'd, we'd like to record that. But really, um, think of us as a as a very neutral third party, really. So Johnny and Jane, um, or whoever it is here, can come over and say, well, what's the problem definition? You know, put us in a room with a whiteboard and talk through why the government needs to be involved or show us who, what you think the impact analysis might be. And we'll say, well, hang on. You know, that's really, really good, the A, B and C effects, but what about this competition effect or... You know, what will this do to house prices if we change where um, we require university students to read our pay to, uh, you know, foreign university students? Or what will be the effect on the labour market if we make those changes to how Pacific labour schemes work? Mm. Now, it's almost like a free consultancy, if you like, to, um, to agencies out there. You know, we don't charge for our time. Obviously, the difference in confidence and not shared more broadly, et cetera. Um, it's kind of held in strictest confidence. But... When done early, that policy analysis framework, when done early, can really dramatically shift the design of a proposal, can identify those weak spots, identify those mindfuls, might find them fields, and give the agency time to actually think about it and address it. Yeah. Rather than when doing late in the process, um, where its usefulness is dramatically reduced. Now, agencies still need OBPR's ticket approval, 
to, to, to describe the quality of the analysis, etc. And I would have thought you'd want to get that done as soon as possible. But in realistic terms, starting with those questions when you tackle the problem or what you think is the problem actually helps you to say, well, actually, no, I do know this really in and out and we don't need over hours assistance, so that's absolutely fine. Or you might say, well, actually, there's an option here that will dramatically fix this issue, but it rests with home affairs. Who do I contact there? There's a there's a revenue option. Maybe we should just tax all drones at 6,000% and that way they won't fly into planes rather than just banning them. Mm. Um, well, that's a treasury option. Um, yeah. So who do I actually connect with? So we actually play a, a bit of a switchboard function in the Australian government to connect you with um, offices and portfolios that could help you develop an option that may well actually better address the problem you're dealing with than the options available to your department. I think there's two things to note here that are pretty significant. So I think the first is just to sort of like contextualize it in a, a relatable way for people that might not work in government. I feel like a similar experience for me would be, say, the the assignment and essay review function at university. If you if you submit it with like ten minutes to go before you, you try to hand something in, no matter what the feedback is, it's probably not going to find it that useful. But if you engage them, you know, two weeks out from when you need to submit an essay and they give you substantive feedback, you're probably going to be able to implement a lot more of that than if you'd wait to the last second. So the second thing that comes to my mind though is that when you talk about like those options that are outside the existing department, so you know, you could be engaging Treasury or Home Affairs or another department, it sounds like the OBPR plays like a critical role in uh, facilitating collaboration with the APS. Yeah, so again, making sure that you're not thinking within your own specialist shoes, but actually engaging all of government to get that whole government analysis, but also potentially all of government action as well. Mm. In looking at that, so let's zoom zoom out a little bit here. So if we look at the broader goal of the OBPR, what is the goal? What's the end game for administering the risk requirements with the impact analysis framework? What's the final outcome? What do we want to achieve? Well, I guess in a sentence, it would be delivering the best possible analysis for government. Really, that's that's what it's about. Um, not just that one department's view, mm. the best whole of government analysis and advice to the decision maker. The whole purpose of the impact analysis framework is to equip the decision maker with all the material they need to know to make a decision. It's not to bind them into the decision. They can go with whatever option they want or something that's not even a piece of paper. That's fine. The whole point of the impact analysis framework is to present them when they sit down to say, should we do X? They understand who will be affected, businesses and individuals, to what extent, what are the risks that are being tackled? What what are the costs of inaction or not doing it? Which of the three or four options is best place to address it or to address it to the largest extent or with the least amount of trade-offs or with the trade-offs they're most happy with? Um, understanding what the views of citizens and businesses are um, of those different issues and then saying, on balance, this is the option we want to do. Now, that, that's the whole purpose of um, bureaucracy in general. But that's the explicit purpose of this framework is, to, is to, to present it in a written form, in the form of a RIS. Uh, and you know, there's a whole round of secondary benefits like the transparency as, as well when these are released so that citizens can see the decision making processes of government and the basis in which major decisions that affect them are made. There's, there's big transparency benefits there as well. Um, uh, but really, it's about supporting the decision makers so they can make the decisions that we um, expect of them. So that sounds good. And I guess coming from an outside perspective again, I think a lot of people would be curious at this point. Have you been able to observe, and can you tell us about times where you've observed improvements in the final outcomes of policy as a result of engaging in this framework? Yeah, I, I guess... For me, the challenge is picking an example that um, uh, shouldn't be considered a critique of that mm -hmm. department. Um, so it would be very bureaucratic and not give you an example. Um, <laughs> but you could imagine you can imagine a proposal that you know. Let's look at the uh, let's look at let's give all kids um, let's all give give all school kids free blue socks. Right? Because uh, we're worried about them not having socks. Right? Make, make up the example. 
And you can imagine, you know, the scenario where the department says, yep, no problems, that's what the minister wants to do, let's, let's run with it. And then, you know, we come in and say, well, but, but what's the problem? Well, the problem is we don't have enough stock. Well, is it because the family doesn't have enough income? Is it they keep losing them? Is it the dog keeps eating and they're fed? Like, what? what's the actual problem here? Mm-hmm. What are you actually going to do? It's like, well, actually, that's a good question. Like, we think the problem is such and such. We say, well, but on what analysis? On what analysis? On what basis are we making that? That's an assumption. How do we test that? How do we prove that? It may well be that um, you know, the, the, the dryer keeps eating eating the socks, and uh, <laughs> I think the little washing dryers do. And you think, where do these socks go? Um, but then it might be, well, why is it blue socks? Why not green socks? Why not yellow socks? Like, why have we locked in on that option to address it? And again, you know, drawing on the analysis and the advice of the department, there are experts in the procurement and production of socks. Right? Um, don't need to be glued. But um, just as a hypothetical, and but we come in and say, well, but why is that the case? And if it's actually going to be more expensive to go to blue socks, why don't we just say socks? Why pick a colour? Why pick a specifics? Is it for wear? You know, rather than socks. So really testing, I guess the the mindset of why we've locked in on that problem and that evidence behind it and that option specifically, and say, well, hang on, what what exactly is it you're trying to fix here? Are there better options to actually solve it? And finding out through that iterative process with the department that it actually it's not the sort of the issue, it's that you know, kids can't um, find the right footwear or whatnot. Being you know, trying to give a really high-level example here, but um, that then leads itself to different options. Procurement of footwear is obviously different to giving kids free socks. Or maybe you don't give it to the kids, they keep losing the kids to the parents. So the delivery of it, the model you choose to deliver it changes. And so actually spitballing that with OVPR, working that through with us to um, bring in that outside perspective because the department's so close to it, they just want to you know, run with that program, you know, see an issue and fix it. And we come in and say, well, just tell us again why we're doing it this way. You know, it's done in a really constructive um, mm-hmm. manner, but it's a critical friend, if you like, for us to sort of keep the ties on and say, actually, no, that's, that's really sensible. We see how you found that. Um, no problems, write that up into your analysis, that's really defensible. Or, or we come in and say, well, hang on, we, we can't see why we've landed on that conclusion or why we've landed on that option. Why haven't we thought about these other things? And so actually it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite um, satisfying as, as the head of OVPR to see those policies change through our involvement. Because ultimately it's not about the production of a piece of paper as such. I couldn't care less about um, satisfying um, just the production of a piece of paper. In my mind, it's about ensuring that the program that's then agreed is a program that's going to work yeah. and that it's not going to be critiqued two or three years later because it didn't work or it didn't solve the precise problem. Or lo and behold, that agency has to come back three years later with a variation to that program because it didn't work as intended because surprise, surprise, it didn't actually fix a problem or it didn't fix a problem well enough. And that's, that's really what impact analysis is about is about getting the products and the programs and the policies right the first time to benefit citizens rather than having to, uh, through a costly exercise, revisit and change programs over time. Okay, I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, to sort of wrap up the substantive part of this discussion here, I kind of wanted to because obviously we've seen a lot of policy being put through and all these NPPs, new proposals. What's, what would you like to see more of? What's, what's the best practice that people should be aiming for to policy office, office pushing things through? Things through? Um, really taking a step back from what you're doing. Um, it's not, not that uncommon that you know, your manager or your manager's manager will say, right, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna bring forward this, uh, we're going to develop this new proposal. The minister's office wants this by uh, you know, Monday next week. We're going to increase the size of this program, we're going to create this new program, etc. And you know, really encouraging people to stop and think through themselves, why am I writing up this program? Not because I was told to do so, but independently thinking, what is it this thing will fix? And it, you know, once you actually lock in on what the problem is, how do I confirm the evidence behind that to say that is a problem? Really, because knowing the answers to those questions helps you clarify in your media releases and your, and your downstream promotional material, you know, what the program's designed to do. 
But before you even get to that point, in your advice to your minister and your advice to government, you know, clarity in what you're actually trying to fix and how the options you come up with address that problem really help you to then understand who's impacted, business or individuals or, or the community, and you know, how are they impacted, and how do I, how do I as a policy officer get to that point where I say, this is the best option for Australia? How do I actually get to that? Not just because someone told me that's the best option I'm going to run with, but how do I look at the impact analysis to really make that point? And it may be that you know, the minister and government wants to go with a different an option. Well, that's, that's fine. But how do we perform our role as public servants to show them the ins and outs of the issue and the ins and outs of the different options to empower them to make that choice? I think that's they're just pausing to think those questions through and if you ever need assistance or help um, with doing that, then you have uh, general numbers on the screen now um, in, in the email. So um, contact us. We're more than happy to talk through this. We see somewhere between 1,500 and 1,800 unique different policy proposals each year. So we're whopping them out. And you wouldn't be surprised to learn that we get very good at spotting impacts and thinking about impacts. You, know, you name it across the department, we've seen it. Over the, um, the versions of the impact analysis framework, there's been some version back to 1986 when it first started. So we get very, very good at breaking down, um, you know, what are pretty complex issues into the component parts, and then thinking through, you know, how do you how do you describe how different cohorts of Australians are impacted? I think that's really good advice in the sense that. I know that at least as a young person coming in, you know, entry level, grad role level sort of job, I think there is a tendency to want to sort of jump in and get started as quickly as possible. That idea that, you know, someone's giving you a task to do and you just want to jump in and send it back as quickly as possible. But that advice of just taking a step back and taking that time to really analyze, I think is quite helpful, underrated. I, I know that Jason actually was immensely to the sense that uh, no matter what, what the task, he's given me a couple of tasks, and the first thing he will always say is, you know, take some time on your own, don't talk to anyone, and form your own thoughts on the matter. And that way we do get that diversity of thought, so I'm not necessarily being influenced by different people's thoughts, we're all bringing our own individual thoughts in. With that in mind, I think it's a great note to end this connected part on. I'm thinking there might be people at this point, university students, um, Thinking about joining the public sector, potentially the OBPR, after hearing about this. For those that are interested, what's the best way to get across uh, info on the OBPR, gain knowledge on the political sector generally, and you know ways to position yourself to get a job in the public sector? Yeah, um, well, there's an awful lot of opportunity at the Australian Public Service through the um, most intakes through the graduate mechanisms. Uh, each department finds their own, and obviously. Department Prime Minister and Cabinet volunteers as well. Um, so there'd be hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of opportunities a year. Um, and, and really, it's about finding um, a department or a portfolio that best speaks to you about your interests and your attitude and what you want to do. They all do very different work through implementation um, focus, the slightly more implementation and policy mix through just outright policy. So. Um, uh, they talk to different people in different ways. So really thinking about what does this department do as opposed to that department. You might think health compared to treasury. You might think you know that, but you know, I'd really challenge you. You really understand exactly what um, health does as opposed to treasury portfolio. What are its functions and you know, what does a day, day look like in that department? Because they're, they're quite different. Um, my advice would be, um, you know, to look at and don't miss the opening of the graduate round. I think a lot of people, uh, uh, sort of search late, don't quite realize that you need to go through it for 10 months or so before, yeah. before that start date. I know as a student, I got to sort of, you know, T minus one month. I was finally <laughs> university and went, right, there are all these jobs. And I found out I should have applied nine months prior. Is it how we accidentally landed in the bubble program? Yeah, that's right. I somehow <laughs> got away in. Um, uh, so really, being aware of the calendar of when things open and close. Um, you know, you might not know in March or April what department you want to go to, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't put an application in to keep that alive so that you don't miss miss the window. Mm -hmm. So really encourage you to think about the timing there. Um, 
Johnny is uh, quite lucky uh, in a sense. Uh, obviously, we're lucky to have Johnny, but Johnny as well, quite lucky that he spotted um, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet's um, domestic um, policy internship, uh, which was advertised roughly when? Right, July. Which is around July, which I think is the second time we've done this, so we're not making any commitments to run it again, but um, we've had about 13 or 14 or so interns come along for two to three months to see see what it's like working here and um, gain some experience working with us. Um, so that's also another avenue, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, APSjobs.carp.au. Occasionally, you'll see the department advertise um, the entry level jobs, but I think for the bulk of the listeners, it's, it's more the graduate programs that are the main intake. Yeah. And I think grad roles usually for government, they open from around March all the way to about maybe May, the later ones open in May. They'll definitely all be closed by around June, July, so it is good to get that early start around at least 10 yeah. months before, so uh, definitely put it in your calendars, and I think that's a good note to end on. Yeah. Well, um, I, might, I might just add, Johnny, that um, I think a lot of people do, in the outside, place a particular focus on an agency. They get really... Mm-hmm. They, I must work at such and such an agency. And you know, having worked in six departments, um, you know, I really want to encourage people to think of an entry into the APS mm-hmm. as that entry point to the wider opportunity in the APS. It doesn't really matter, in, in my personal view, it doesn't really matter which department you come in on. You'll have interesting, challenging and complex work. I can't think of a department that doesn't. Um, and once you're in the APS, then, you know, you have that exposure through all opportunities that are around. So I really, my advice would be really not to fixate on a particular department at the exclusion of not applying in others. Um, you know, I've had many steps in my career where I've moved places or landed places where I thought, oh, this is precisely what I wanted to do, but then absolutely love the role. So um, particularly if you're on the outside, don't make assumptions on what a department does and doesn't do. I think yeah. you'd be surprised. Definitely. And I think it's it, it's definitely a point to make that I think mobility within the APX is a lot easier than breaking in from the outside. Yeah, so right. that fixation can often hold you back in the sense that just because you land somewhere that you might not thought you would have wanted to be, A, you get that chance to expose yourself to new things. But B, worst case scenario, you're right and you don't like it, you can move around within the APX a lot more easily. So I think that, those are some very important tips to take note of. Other than that, I think at this point, I'll, I'll wrap it up. And Jason, thank you so much for taking the time today. And thank you for giving your advice and frank thoughts and everything. Uh, and good luck, listeners, for those applications.